Welcome back to this update. I have recently acquired a new dress, intending to visit a friend up in Ascot, where we plan to have a bit of a party. We're all set to watch an event live on a big screen, and we're anticipating an epic time. Lately, I've received several messages from individuals questioning why I'm not in London amidst all the action. Allow me to clarify. Firstly, being present in a crowded place won't offer the same level of enjoyment compared to the comfort of having my personal space, a bar service, and, undoubtedly, a sizable screen to view the proceedings. Secondly, there was an unfortunate incident at a Fat Oi Slim concert I attended years ago. The venue was shifted from Brighton's beachfront, where everyone could party, to a narrow, lengthy road called Madeira Drive. In the ensuing chaos, my friend and I were caught in a crowd crush lasting barely 60 seconds. However, since then, the mere thought of being amidst such a large number of people triggers panic attacks, making it an unfavorable setting for me. Therefore, I'd much rather remain in my own space. Now, in regard to London, there's a significant influx of tourists from all corners of the world converging here for this momentous occasion. However, what's capturing the attention of many, especially the ladies, and perhaps some gentlemen, is the abundance of military uniforms. They seem to be omnipresent, crowding train stations, underground tubes, and spilling onto the streets for rehearsals and band processions. These rehearsals commence as early as dawn when the roads are serene, enabling lucky early risers to capture breathtaking photographs. The extensive scale of these rehearsal parades indicates the grandeur anticipated for Saturday's event. I must admit my frustration with certain aspects of the media and their portrayal of events. There's a continuous stream of news suggesting cancellations, accusations of going woke, and various speculations about Charles and other aspects of the event. It feels as though they are deliberately trying to demotivate and dissuade people from watching. My stance remains, give it a chance. If it doesn't appeal to you, switch it off after 10 minutes. Personally, I don't lend credence to these stories and prefer to observe and form my opinions after witnessing the actual proceedings which I shall undoubtedly share upon my return next week. Speaking of intriguing snippets, a heartwarming video surfaced on social media from King Charles' Instagram account. It depicts a young Charles and Princess Anne during their mother's coronation, engaging in typical childish antics. The adorable moment where Princess Anne mimics Charles by covering her face exemplifies that regardless of status, children will always find joy in playful moments even during historically significant events. However, amidst this anticipation and lightheartedness, an incident outside Buckingham Palace took a serious turn. A man was detained under the Mental Health Act for throwing shotgun cartridges within the palace grounds. The situation necessitated controlled explosions by the authorities to neutralize the potential threat. Surprisingly, the man in question turned out to be Jacob Rees-Mogg, an esteemed member of parliament. The live footage of this incident showcased the epitome of British resolve, maintaining composure and carrying on despite the unforeseen disruption. The nonchalant reaction of those involved, expressing sentiments like, I don't see why we have to move, embodies the quintessential British spirit, staying unfazed even in potentially hazardous situations. Some witnessed this incident unfold live on GB News, while others, like myself, caught wind of it through Twitter it's intriguing how social media allows for the rapid sharing of such moments, albeit accompanied by a touch of humor. A shared photograph of the intruder attempting to cause disruption at Buckingham Palace incited a mix of amusement and surprise among those following the events. The recent interviews have sparked a whirlwind of discussions. Princess Anne took the spotlight in her exclusive 30-minute interview with Canadian broadcaster CBBC alongside Adrian Arsenault. Praised for her blend of humor and no-nonsense attitude, she seems to embody a combination of her father, Prince Philip, and the late Queen. Although I haven't caught the full interview, I did catch glimpses. Princess Anne delved into the contentious topic of slavery, expressing a view that challenges the necessity of Charles' recent decision to investigate the monarchy's links to slavery. While I comprehend Charles' response to these demands, it seems improbable that he can satisfy those clamoring for acknowledgement, reparations, and compliance. Even after meeting these demands, the cycle of demands will likely persist. 
The discourse often overlooks historical facts. The UK played a pivotal role in eradicating slavery, passing the act led by William Wilberforce in 1807, which marked the abolition of slavery across the British Empire. Subsequently, in 1808, the UK established the West Africa Squadron to protect Africa's coastline from slave ships. It's worth noting that the US didn't abolish slavery until 1865, yet there's animosity directed at the UK from America. Princess Anne's suggestion for Charles to privately fund a comprehensive documentary highlighting the UK's efforts in abolishing slavery, featuring historians worldwide, is a noteworthy idea. However, it's uncertain whether such efforts would appease those demanding acknowledgement and reparations. Another valid point raised by Princess Anne pertains to the number of active senior royals. Charles has endeavored to streamline the monarchy, curtailing privileges and making cutbacks in royal residences. While the public generally supports this move, a downside emerges due to the insufficient representation across patronages and charities. The Queen and Prince Philip managed over a thousand patronages collectively, a feat unlikely to be matched by the limited number of senior working royals now. As the older generation of senior royals gradually steps back, the burden falls on a handful of individuals like Princess Anne, Princess Alexandra, the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, and the Duke of Kent, whose ages range between 72 and 87. In the upcoming years, their retirement will further diminish the active working royals. Considering the taxpayer's perspective, funding numerous multimillionaire members for extravagant lifestyles and travels doesn't sit well. However, the primary concern revolves around the costs of security, which currently burden only a select few. Perhaps in the future, other members like Lady Louise, the Earl of Wessex, or even Beatrice and Eugenie might assume more significant roles, easing the burden on taxpayer-funded security. Engagements and patronages undertaken by royals hold immense importance for various charities and organizations. A royal visit brings much-needed attention and publicity to these causes, aiding in garnering support and donations. Charles might consider allowing certain members, like Eugenie, Beatrice, Zara, and Mike, to shoulder these responsibilities without burdening taxpayers for security costs during unofficial engagements. It appears the recent spotlight is on the Marco clan interview. I haven't had the chance to watch the entire thing due to being occupied with studies. From what I gathered in the bits I did see, it seems like the family is trying to share their perspective. There wasn't anything scandalous revealed. It felt more like typical clickbait. Nonetheless, the family is still in a defensive stance. Some argue they shouldn't have accepted payment for interviews, but considering how the media initially portrayed them and how Harry and Meghan contributed to that by excluding them from the wedding, it's a complex situation. If Meghan's family had attended the wedding or if Meghan had communicated with her father, the drama might have been less. However, Meghan's inclination towards drama fueled the speculations and painted her family negatively. Meghan cutting ties with her father is her choice, but handling it publicly without addressing it prolonged the drama. They didn't ask for this attention. Meghan marrying into the royal family brought the spotlight onto her family. And when Meghan didn't invite them to the wedding, it piqued people's interest in the Markle side. If they can earn from their association with Meghan for a better life, why not? Regarding rumors of Harry potentially being a no-show, it seems he's being secretive about his plans, causing speculation. Some feel his intentions are childish, especially considering the extensive travel for just a couple of hours at the event and then rushing back for his son's birthday. The uncertainty around his attendance might just be a dramatic twist at the last minute. Shifting gears to the Met Gala, there are reports that Meghan was a no-show. Speculation suggests she declined to avoid more attention, but it's met with skepticism. It's doubtful she wasn't invited especially considering Anna Wintour's connections to the Queen. I can't imagine Meghan attending without Wintour's approval. Even a cockroach made an appearance, which might sting a bit for Meghan. The gala's theme was Karl Lagerfeld, and some outfits, like Jared Leto's portrayal of Lagerfeld's cat, Chopette, were eccentric. However, I highly doubt Harry and Meghan would have been invited, given the gala's exclusivity and their current standing in certain circles. 
Wrapping up, there's a lot to unpack and I'll strive to stay on top of all the royal news. Until next time, take care.